May I now speak in the name of God, who creates, redeems, and sustains. Amen. I've had some memorable Holy Weeks and Monday Thursdays in my time. 42 years ago, as part of a tiny Christian community caught up in the clutches of a revolution, and 17 years ago in the intensive care unit of Leicester Royal Infirmary following the birth of my twins. There have been other extraordinary years too, and I'm sure that each of you will have your own stories. This year is another significant one. It's my first in Chelmsford Diocese, getting to know you as you are me. And all at a time of significant change and challenge for the world and for the church. Horrors continue in Ukraine, and indeed in Afghanistan and other oft-forgotten places, and the impact is devastating for many of our fellow human beings. The environmental crisis continues to loom large, and COVID-19 still lingers with its powerful tentacles. And meanwhile, we continue our process of transformation towards becoming the diocese that we are being called to be. Uncertain and exciting, and sometimes painful though it is, we are in this together, all of us. And so here I must once again thank you for your ministry and say what an immense joy and privilege it is to work with you and to be alongside you. This period of pandemic from which we're still emerging has, I suspect, had implications for each of us personally and for the life of our diocese far greater than we're yet fully aware of or can understand. It has challenged many of our assumptions and in some cases caused us to reconsider our way of being. Initially, when lockdown was first imposed, many right across the Church of England busied themselves in a mad flurry of activity. Clergy, and I include myself as a bishop in that, and lay leaders running around trying to retain what little control we had left, continuing to be useful, ensuring that we were doing as much as possible for those in our care providing worship, offering pastoral support, keeping the show on the road somehow. Looking back, I wonder if, albeit with the best of intentions, we were replacing one form of busyness for another, and all the while avoiding the question, what are we for if we can't do the things that we've always done. And so I ask you now, what are we for if, as clergy and as lay ministers, we can't do the things that we've always done? Activity can be a form of displacement, a means of refusing to face reality of hanging on to the last shreds of control instead of acknowledging our helplessness and taking the opportunity to reconnect with our vocation in a new and deeper way and to learn afresh what it means to be the people of God. And then as time went on in the pandemic, the busyness mingled with all kinds of other complexities and for many has led to new levels of exhaustion and, I sense, a deep existential question about our purpose as clergy and church leaders and indeed our role as a church in this nation. 
And that's largely why I've been so keen for us to share in a period of holy sabbatical during this season of Lent. Simply to be, to listen to the Holy Spirit, and to reconnect. To reconnect with one another in a deep way and with our core vocation and calling. We have not been through a revolution here, but there are similarities. I remember well in Iran all those years ago that feeling of the church being stripped of the things that we had taken for granted. <coughs> as our Christian hospitals and schools were closed or confiscated, as properties were ransacked, church assets frozen, legal identity removed, worship restricted, clergy and lay people imprisoned and even murdered. Now make no mistake, the scaffolding that was being dismantled was made up of good things. The medical and the educational work, the commitment to service and to sharing the gospel, these were valuable and precious things that God had blessed over the years. Just like our mission and ministry here in Chelmsford has been good and God has blessed it over the years. And yet we too are now being laid bare. Numbers are down, finances are tight, we are being stripped of many of the things that may well have been important and good, but are now being taken away, and there may well be more to come. So what does it all mean? Where do we find gift and blessing amidst all of this challenge? During the revolution in Iran, my father spoke these words, which I still have on a poster up on my study wall. I've quoted them often, so my apologies if you've heard them before, but I should say that you are likely to hear them again too. For me, they still speak with profound depth, and they seem to have something to say to us today. This is what he said. The way of the cross has suddenly become so meaningful that we have willingly walked in it with our Lord near us. Our numbers have become smaller, our earthly supports have gone, but we are learning the meaning of faith in a new and deeper way. So how might we today find meaning in our present reality and learn about faith in new and deeper ways? How might we focus on the things that we do have and the things that we can do instead of the things we don't have and can't do? How can we rediscover our vocation for this time and this place with renewed energy and confidence rather than weeping for what once was and is no more. In our Gospel reading from Luke today, Jesus lays out his vocation and articulates what it is that he's been called to do and to be. He quotes verses from Isaiah and takes on the mantle prepared for him. Publicly and unashamedly, he leans into his calling. If you carry on reading the verses that are just beyond today's passage, you will see that it doesn't go well. When he'd finished speaking, the people were enraged. They drove him out of the town, eager to hurl him off the cliff. There was no warm reception, no thanks or encouragement, no plans to develop strategies for how to bring this wonderful vision to fruition. Only hostility and violent resistance, which led eventually to Calvary and the cross. Arguably, it all went horribly wrong and ended in abject failure. But isn't that the whole point? 
Jesus was called into a broken world to preach his message and fulfill his calling, not for any success that could be measured in worldly terms, but trusting that God would use his faithfulness and his sacrifice somehow. Now, I do believe that we all know that in the depths of our heart, but it is so easy to forget and we do find it so very difficult to live by ourselves. All too easily we feel like we're failing if the numbers don't add up and if the old patterns are no longer sustainable. And we persist in measuring our successes in worldly terms. But brothers and sisters, we are called to do and be no less than our Lord to pray and to preach and to act in season and out of season, to articulate our calling and share the message of the gospel in word and deed, whether things are easy or hard, whether it seems that we're being successful or not. We are called to be faithful and trust that God will bless our efforts however small and insignificant they may sometimes feel. And God will bless them according to God's timing and wisdom, not ours. If we continue to sow the seeds, one day, whether we know it or not, the harvest will be gathered. So as we continue to journey into the unknown, my fervent prayer is that we can face up to the pain and the uncertainty, for that is always where healing begins, but without being unduly anxious. Let us take responsibility where we can, of course, but let us also always know that the future is in God's hands and there is no better thought than that. I trust that this Lent has begun to prepare us for what, that which lies ahead, helping us to turn our faces towards the future in sure and certain hope that Jesus Christ is ever with us and will continue gently to lead us on. I hope that we can find meaning and purpose in our present reality and with it, renewed vigour and energy for ministry and service. You too, every one of you, including those who aren't able, with, able to be with us here today, you too are part of this story. Nothing is wasted, nothing is too small, Every experience and every encounter hold within them the possibility of new life. And God is calling each one of us to play our part joyfully and in obedience. And so I want to end with some words of wisdom by Julian of Norwich, written at the height of the Black Death in one of the worst affected towns in England. And in this, God showed me a little thing, the quantity of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand, as it seemed. And it was round as any ball. I looked upon it with the eye of my understanding and thought, what may this be? And it was answered generally thus, it is all that is made. I marvelled how it might last, for I thought it might suddenly have fallen to nothing for littleness. And I was answered in my understanding, it lasts and ever shall, for God loves it. In this little thing I saw three properties. The first is that God made it, the second that God loves it, and the third that God keeps it. Amen.